Hi, you guys. I'm Sarah. I'm not going to be over on this side at all, so I'm going to come say hi over here before I never come back. Um, I'm a designer. Um, I started uh, learning D3 in 2012 when I quit my job to learn how to program because there was like, you know, you're not going to do it unless you just do it. Um, and I had the like wonderful, like super noob experience of learning D3 at the same time that I was also learning JavaScript and learning how to program it all. <laughs> so I actually, um, for a long time, had this like huge chip on my shoulder because I like thought I wasn't a programmer and I didn't know how to do things. And um, actually, it's taken, I guess, like a couple like years to come around and be like, oh, actually, like, you know, what's the talk that I would have wanted to hear when I was getting started? And you know, what are the alternate pathways to learning how to program that's not like, you know, an object is breakfast and breakfast has the properties, you know, hot or cold and the, you know, yeah, whatever. So I, I um, put together this talk, which is, as Kai said, totally bonkers. It's about how you have a design driven approach to D3. And I'm actually going to give the presentation in this program called Sketch. Have you guys seen Sketch before? Yeah, it's kind of like the new kid on the block in vector programs, so like the new illustrator. Um, and uh, really excited to show how you can cheat the entire system. You know, like I'm not going to do any enters or any like appends or anything like that. It's like totally cheating, but uh, I think it's it's kind of a cool approach. And I think that anybody in the room, no matter how experienced or inexperienced you are, can maybe get something out of it. So uh, like I said, my name is Sarah. I work at a company called Lever. Um, we make data-driven collaborative hiring software. And this is kind of what we do. Um, and then I also do design for a company called Periscope that does uh, super fast business intelligence dashboards. So I do a lot of um, designing data. Uh, Frankly, like I add the most value when I'm kind of like designing the interfaces, laying them out. So I like found that you know, uh, prototyping with the actual, you know, JSON blob can get me so far, but it actually doesn't always like push me over the edge. Like it doesn't have me like really like open up my thinking to like the entire scope of the problem. So I'm kind of here to talk about a visual first approach to prototyping with D3. And I think that you know, uh, there's a couple things you can get out of it. So, D3 noobs who can get overwhelmed <laughs> with select, select all, data, datum, all that sort of stuff. Um, this is probably like you know a way to like dip your toes in uh, before you you know jump right into a complex layout or a super pure like Mike Bostock example. Um, I think it's great for designers. Any designers here tonight? Yay. Um, who, you know, I, I don't know if this is like, this sounds like you, but who get frustrated trying to get like a basic example working when it just looks like crap and you're using like Times New Roman and like everything has like ugly black borders and it just drives you crazy. Um, so it's a way to, to get something you're proud of really fast. And then also for D3 experts who, <laughs> I, I don't mean this to come out wrong, but who can get stuck in a visual style that is convenient because it piggybacks on the tools you're using, but you know, sometimes isn't ideal. And I think data visualization is all about getting data to a point where the person looking at it at a glance like can get something immediately, right? Where there's, you know, the style like is perfectly matched to the data that you have. I think that's some something that people who kind of believe in the power of data visualization like can can really believe. So what am I kind of talking about? I'm talking about debug view, you know, like border, one pixel, solid red, using super saturated RGB color space uh, and ignoring Topography, especially numbers, and you know, making stuff like like that. Um, so uh, you know, that that said, debug view can also be really awesome. You guys should check out debugview.tumblr.com for you know some great examples. But yeah, okay. So um, like I said, noobs can get the hang of things before dealing with uh, data binding, scaling, uh, tweaking things, getting everything like to fit just right, and Let's just not deal with axes and labels at all. Because I don't know if you guys have dealt with SVG text, but I don't think that that's anything anybody wants to, to start off with. Um, and then experts instead can focus on the visualization of design, you know, legibility, 
uh, getting kind of like rhythm in place so that you can actually see relationships between the data. And I think this is huge, like hierarchy, making sure that like the important things pop out first and the less important things can come as like secondary information. So what exactly am I going to do? I'm going to show, um, I'm going to try to show. I'm nervous. I'm going to try to do some stuff live. Um, so we're going to develop a prototype in Sketch, purely graphical, export that file to SVG, and then use spreadsheets, oh my god, to simplify the data binding. Um, so this is for anybody who, you know, maybe you just want to do something really fast, or maybe you're just not ready to deal with structuring your data so that everything can magically cascade beautifully from it the way it seems to in all the Mike Bostock examples. And then basically, what is that going to be? It's a super, super simple introduction to D3's data binding and object manipulation, where we're going to copy paste the SVG into the HTML document. We're going to use D3.csv to load a CSV file. And we're not going to enter or exit at all. OK, so now I have to put this down. Um, where are we going to start? So I already made a mock. Um, this is just kind of like a static, you know, vector program. You can see that I should look at the screen to do all this stuff. You know, all of these things are literally just elements, right? So I drew this. <laughs> and Sketch, uh-oh, I'm not full screened. So Sketch, like many other programs, has this kind of layer tree that you can group things, ungroup things, and, you know, all these things have properties. Uh, Sketch is actually a really great program in that it's really built for the web. So for what it's worth, like all the CSS styles are, you know, kind of like built into the program. It's, it's pretty nice. So I basically kind of spent all this time like laying out a bunch of stuff, creating a bunch of things. And then it was actually a really important part of this process for what we're kind of going to do here to go in and clean up all of the, the file trees. So instead of looking like this, this is like usually what it looks like, right? Um, it looks like this. And something that's super key in this workflow is that if you have something like all these bars, that we're going to name them all the exact same thing. So bar, 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 bar. OK. So we'll just have to kind of remember this stuff. So we'll come back to it in a little bit. but. I'm going to go to export, uh, export this file. I'm going to call it um, ski, put it into this folder that I made, um, and then choose SVG as the format. OK, so do that. Oops. And then um, when I open this up in my text editor. This is, you know, this is the SVG we're all familiar with, except it has a lot of crap in it. Um, let me actually, uh, where's my other file? OK, well, I'll just, there it is. Oh, no. OK. So um, there's, so all the, the graphics programs that output SVG, they're going to go ahead and insert like a description created with Sketch, blah, 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 um, and have all these like, in this case, there's like, you know, specific kind of stuff. It can get really noisy. And the cool thing is you can just delete it because it's just text. And you can like get rid of it if you want to. Um, or there's also like a lot of like, if you're like the neurotic type and you just don't want any crap or anything in here, there's like things like SVG Cleaner is like some software you can use other types of things like that. But the main thing that I do at this point is, by default, Sketch outputs everything as um, all those layer names that we saw there. Um, these all get added as IDs to these elements. So you can see like ID equals top countries. That's this top countries group right here. So I always go through and I say, oops, ID equals find all of them, make bajillion cursors, and change those to class. Because this is another important part of that workflow, where if you're going to have bar, 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 you want to be able to grab all of them as a class, not an ID. So now I'm just going to save this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I really should. <laughs> OK. Um, so I feel terrible every time I close that, but it's never the right time. OK. So <laughs> I'm going to create a new file. 
um, have kind of an HTML boilerplate going. I'm going to save it here. And um, let's go ahead and do the thing we always do when we get started and make a container div. OK, and then make a script. OK. So um, there's a couple ways you can get your SVG into here. If you're kind of like, you know, oh yeah, I like know how to do this, you can, um, you can use D3XML to load the file, um, which is nice, because then if you like change it and save it, you can just like keep loading it. But you know, as crazy it is, as it is, you can actually just like grab this entire thing, <laughs> copy it, and paste it right here into your container. And so let's like get rid of that because it's kind of scary. Um, I'm going to collapse it. Okay. So now the SVG, all those like elements that we made, everything, the entire like structure of it, getting all these like colors and styles and oh my god, even fonts, they're, they're all in there. Um, and you just don't have to look at it. But what you do have to remember is the structure that you created because that's how we're going to start grabbing these things. So if I come in here, the very first thing I'm going to, oh, data. I forgot about the data. OK, so the very first thing we're going to do is get some data. So I just pulled this like tiny little data set of cross-country Olympics data um, from like, I think there's like just three, three Olympics here, so that it's like pretty small and manageable. Um, but you know, you could imagine maybe you're working on a project where people can click through to any like any year, any event, and they just want to see like all these like hundreds of events, and you're going to have this little like unit, you know, that 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 looks like this that they can they can see like you know the the age distribution of the medalists and the top countries and the average age of the medalists by medal and and all that sort of stuff. So here's that data. Um, you know, someday I'll be able to like grab a huge data set, but for now it's just going to be this thing. Um, so <laughs> you can easily kind of like get little slices of the data that you can then just plug in and play with by doing a pivot table report. And here I'm just going to add, um, oh yeah, the age, and then I want the total metals and sum them, right? So what are we looking at here? It's the age distribution of all the medalists, right? So then I'm going to download as CSV, put that sucker into my folder. Um, uh, ski data. And then here in my data, I'm going to say d3.csv, very useful function, which takes function with error, and you can like log your errors and be all good about that. And then whatever you're going to want to call your data when you refer to it, actually let's call it age data. And then in here, we're going to do all the work that we need with the age data that we successfully call. So I'm not going to do the error stuff, but you guys should, should probably do it. I oh, I have a problem. Oh, no. Everything's going terribly. So I would not load the file? It has a name. Oh, yeah. <sighs> name. Sorry, I got super nervous when I was doing this. And I was like, is it wise to start with nothing? But I was like, that's the talk I would have wanted to see. OK, so um, <laughs> ski data dot CSV. Does this look good? Good, you guys? Almost. Cool. OK, so uh, age data. So now if we're in browser, we can. A, see this SVG, oh my god, all of it's there. It's crazy. And then I just logged you know, this, this data that we have, and it just has the counts and the age. Actually, did my thing didn't have columns, didn't it? OK. Let me actually reopen that and clean it up a little so that we can call it something. Um, oh, wait. Practice run through file. Okay. Um, so let's see, this is age and count. Okay, so now if we go and look at the data now, 
the um, D3 CSV function has parsed it out to a JSON object. It just pulled in the header from the CSV file to make it age count. Um, so now we actually like are good to go. We can get these bars to to um, to all be. We want to get their heights to reflect the the count value, right, for each of those those values. So we're just going to. D3, well, var um, d3.select. And then this is, again, where that structure that we created in the sketch file comes into play. So we want to select um, age dist, right? And then I happen to have put it inside of a thing called chart. That's where like all these bars are. And then we're going to do the select all. to grab all the bars inside of here. Bar, OK, bar. OK. And then all we want to do is set the attribute of height to d dot count, right? Oh my god. Oh my god, oh my god, you guys are falling apart here. Select all data, age data. OK. I don't have to enter. Isn't that crazy? OK. Yeah. OK. So <laughs> what just happened here? Oh my god. So after I totally forgot to bind the data and was reminded, I added it in. So we've selected all the bars, which we've already made. And in this case, it's convenient because I counted how many there needed to be and all that stuff. But anyways, um, we selected all the bars. And then we bound the data to this age data that we you know, selected here. What is this grand total thing? I'm just going to delete that because it's going to be annoying. OK. So, um, and then we're just going to set the attribute height to return d.count. And yeah, doing enters would make this more robust and would let you bind things to more data. Like doing your actual like, you know, appends would let you like be more robust. But you know, if you just want to get like an infographic that you've planned a lot like in place, or if you just like want to get started, um, I think this can be like a really great way to just see what D3 can do from like a, an attribute setting standpoint, or maybe just planning like how you're going to get it to work before you like embark on some really ambitious big thing. Um, so here we're going to go into Chrome and see what it looks like. Um, and so you can see it's set all these values dynamically. It's obviously like needs some scaling. And then it's like upside down. So <laughs> um, you know, these are all 140 tall. So I'm just going to go in here and cheat a little. So var bar height equals 140. And let's just say there's some multiplier that's 4. So return d.count times multiplier. And then you want to do bar height minus that value, right? OK. So now what does it look like? Oh, did I still do? Oh, I have to trans. OK. So now it is the right height, sort of. But it's still upside down, because you actually just need to translate them, right? So let's do another attribute. And let's say um, transform translate. And then function. I don't know why I did this up here. I was just getting nervous. OK. Um, no. Oh, thank you. Sorry. That's not. Uh, do you ever get this thing when like your mock looks exactly like the final thing that you don't remember which one you're in? That's a designer problem, I guess. Okay. There we go. So. Um, so yeah, I I think it's pretty cool. And you know, I did another one, but we don't have to walk through it. Um, where I like hooked up this chart so that it has like the actual top countries and the counts, and then I 
had to actually work today at work and didn't do the last one. But um, I, I just think that you know there's there's a lot of promise for for doing an approach where you're really thinking about the end product first and the visual like look and feel first and like how someone who's going to come across it is going to see it and react immediately. And uh, you know it's like it's easy to get you know coerced by like what's easy to do in D3 and it can be hard for you know an expert to to break into new territory and try something new. So maybe for all of those of you who are you know seasoned seasoned D3 experts that are just party crashing the noob meetup, uh, you can find some value in this um, the next time you wanna you wanna do something different. And then you know for all the the D3 noobs out there, uh, maybe this is a great way to to break into the, the data binding nut that Shirley started to crack um, earlier. And for all the designers, uh, you can do it. D3 is really great and awesome. Sketch is also really powerful. And uh, I think the fact that designer tools and developer tools are getting more and more, I don't know, like they're just kind of coming closer together. It's a pretty exciting time for, for crossover. Thanks. Hey. <laughs> hey, did that sketch program when you export out to SVG, did it transform the text into SVG or did it hold it as text? Um, well, like all, all programs have kind of their weird conventions. And this one, it'll make it a text element and then put a T-span inside of it. That's just how it works. It's kind of weird. Um, yeah, so I mean, like whatever, whatever um, program you end up using, sorry if that's tiny. Um, It'll just do something with it. Did you preload a certain font in Sketch that it, it automatically just moves that back to that? Um, I mean, I'm doing this locally, which I think simplifies the font problem. But like, you could imagine that it would be like a similar issue to just doing any sort of web development. Hey. I was, I was just curious in the in your workflow in Sketch when you were. Sort of, you laid it out, and then you said you had to restructure the, all the elements in order to be able to address them later. Do you have any any interesting workflow tips to like grab them all and retitle them all, or is that sort of a laborious? Uh, to name them all bar, for instance. Yeah, I mean, like in all, like so, Sketch is going to be different from Illustrator, which is going to be different from Inkspace, but like, I copy paste them because it, instead of option dragging them, it doesn't add that copy thing. It's, it's totally like, you know, inane kind of to talk about out loud. But uh, it's because it's drag and drop and because you can like really immediately see like what element it's connected to, there's just, you know, it just isn't that complicated. So I think where I used to find myself in the console trying to understand how this data that I downloaded from BLS is actually structured and like how I'm going to like, I, you know, where is everything? like. With this, like on the other hand, like with this, it's just like okay, you have total control, and it may not be as scalable, but like you can reorder your layers, and you can go and make your pivot tables, and you know, just kind of like uh, have a lot of control at the expense maybe of the scalability of it or how robust it is. Hey, sorry, I, I did tell you in advance that I would forget about you guys. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's actually, it's like the high level, it's really the same. Uh, like literally the difference come down to how they export SVG files. Um, but, and, and then I also do think that like, uh, I don't know, like Sketch I think is a little bit more just like web first. So they, they do like the, the attributes and stuff a little bit cleaner, but it's pretty moot, it's the same. Hey. <laughs> Hi, so um, for exporting to, uh, to SVG, CorelDRAW does a really crappy, amazingly crappy job of it. <coughs> Illustrator does an excellent job of it, but it's quite expensive. Sketch, the last time I took something that I, I drew up as a vector, um, it created a ping and wrapped it in an image tag inside the SVG. Genova. You just have to make sure that when you export, you're choosing SVG from the, the menu. Uh, it can be easy to overlook, but it's just at the bottom of the export flow. Okay. Oh. 
Maybe. Okay. So, in this one, where you have the, the bar graph, and you have, you know, what can become a really long um, SVG. If this was really a dashboard, would you have those as separate SVGs? Like, how would you manage a project like this, like a visual first one, if you wanted to have multiple pieces? Um, I don't know that I'd recommend putting this in like a finished like product. Um, but definitely, like as you may be like prototyping something like this, it's really you know. I think it has to do with how familiar are, you are with the graphics tool as much as it does how familiar you are with D3. Like, if it feels like it's getting out of control with all the layers and you just can't manage it, then you know, scale back. But I think, yeah, it's definitely something to consider. Like, if you're totally new to doing graphics programs and you just have like hundreds of layers and it stresses you out, like, you know, it, it's just like biting off more than you can chew in a coding project. So I, I think, you know, in that sense, it's totally based on just your familiarity with the tool. Oh, there's somebody way in the back. Yeah, when you're playing around with this technique, have you run into situations where the number of rows in your data set didn't really match up with the number of elements in your um, SVG? How did you deal with that? Yeah, uh, I mean, sorry. sorry, the question was how do you deal with situations when your mock like has either not enough rows or too many rows than your data, like when there's like misalignment between the two? That's just the limitation of this like well, that's the limitation of this process or workflow and the strength of D3. Like, the total like, awesome thing about D3 is that it has that pattern and that you don't have to worry about it and that you can generate all of your elements dynamically. Um, like, that's what makes it so powerful for data visualization um, and so robust. Uh, but at the same time, when you're learning or prototyping and it's just not that important to have that, it can sometimes just like be intimidating or be just too much firepower for what you're trying to do. So I think that that's the exact weakness of this approach, but you know, that's the strength of D3. Cool. All right, thanks, Sarah.